I'm welcome. Yeah. Now, can they see John? Yes. There he is. All right. Shall shall I put John here or so I can see? Yeah. I think it's a good idea. All right. Reverend John Strickland, welcome. Hey, it is so good to be back with you by yeah. the uh, electronic world. That's the way the electronic world. Be. Yes. Yes. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us uh, in your retirement, right? 40 years as a minister. And I'd yeah. just like to um, introduce John, Reverend John Strickland. He is the, uh, he was a unity minister for over 40 years. And he uh, was the director of Silent Unity, the global prayer ministry at Unity Village for many years. Yeah. And uh, just a, a wonderful man, loved by a lot of people around the world, actually. And we're just happy that you're with us today. Uh, we, your book is fantastic. He's the author of Think, Feel, and Heal, Eight Keys to Health and Wholeness. Yep. And That's it. What a wonderful book. I wanted to ask you, John, what, you know, there's a lot of books written uh, on prosperity, on success, and other topics, but you wrote your book on healing. What, what was your inspiration for doing a book on healing? Okay, the inspiration was I needed a healing. That ah. was uh, many years ago before I was a minister. I was a football player. I don't really want to tell you uh, wh where I played because I got beat by uh, University of Georgia's homecoming, something like 55 to nothing. Oh, boy. Uh, but that school was the only private school in the Southeastern Conference. And uh, I played I played football there at least my freshman year. And playing against Alabama, yes, the Alabama. Oh, wow, that was a big game. Vanderbilt, uh, right? Vanderbilt it, it versus was. Alabama? Yeah, there you go with Vanderbilt. But uh, I, I had a, a neck and shoulder injury that was, uh, according to the doctors, uh, not supposed to recover. I had torn major nerves, and they said with therapy, I could get better, but it would never heal. So my response was to drop out of school, turn in my scholarship, and go back to Atlanta and lick my wounds. But I found myself going back to the Unity Church where I had grown up. Hmm. And you know... They didn't care whether I was injured. They didn't care whether I was playing football. They just loved me. And so I, I speak in favor of a spiritual community uh, to help you in your healing process. Now, what happened when I go back to that church is uh, because I was depressed, I was miserable. I had identified myself as an athlete, a scholarship winning uh, football player. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I was I wasn't that anymore. So my self identity I didn't really know what I am was, but I went back to Unity and I felt better um, for an hour each week. The rest of the time I felt miserable. But one of the things that particularly uh, touched me deeply was uh, the meditation. You know, seven to eight, ten minutes of meditation. I think in New York you do more than that on Sunday morning, don't you? Ah, uh, yeah, we do. We do about fifteen minutes. Uh, Which might be too much, but uh, we need it. We need all the help we can get. But in any count, the meditation is where I felt oneness with God. And I found as time went by, I felt that more than an hour a week. And about nine months later, I woke up one morning. I said, you know, I'm not feeling bad. And, and what is it I'm feeling? And I said, it's good. <laughs> by process of elimination, if I'm not feeling bad, I'm feeling good. Yeah. And, um, and I knew that my neck and shoulder were healed. Wow. And, and nothing uh, has been impossible to me in that. So uh, my, my original plan, and, and, and remember uh, the saying, if you want to make God laugh, show him your plans. Uh, yeah. I was going to be a high school math teacher and a football coach. Hmm. Well, I stayed with math, but dropped the football and uh, in addition to a math major, I minored in philosophy and psychology. Hmm. And uh, as a sophomore, 
I was tricked into applying for ministerial school by my minister's secretary. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not ready yet. They said, she said, now she was lying, but I didn't know that uh, you, you, they're having field interviews for ministerial school. And you have an appointment at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. If you don't show up, you'll never, ever get to be a unity minister. That's the part where wow. she was lying. So I showed up and I said, listen, I, I want to finish my college degree. And they said, we want you to do that too, but come and apply again uh, in your senior year, which is what I did. And I, I was one of a handful of unity ministers, maybe five or six that were ordained at 23. So mm. been, been in yeah, this that's long. younger than I was. I was 26. Wow. But I'm still young. I mean, yeah. my, my school, my class, the average age of a student was 35 to 55. Yeah. So, but the, but the but the point was, after I found healing, I I wanted to help people in the way I had been helped, and uh, I didn't want to go back out on the football field, <coughs> and uh, I would not have minded teaching math. I went ahead and got my degree in mathematics. I was pretty good in math, and you you uh, you know you wonder well why why would you major in math before going in ministry? Well. I, I like the kind of spirituality that unity teaches that is scientific. Yeah. And uh, math is scientific. Yeah. Although I remember in school and college, a fella came to me and said, uh, the Bible has been mathematically proven to be the word of God. Huh. And I said, uh, you know, I'm a math major and I'm pretty good. I'm actually an honors student. Could you explain that to me? And he said, well, no. But that's what my, that, <laughs> Sounded good, though. <laughs> that That is just what my Sunday school teacher said. I said, well, would you go back to your Sunday school teacher and ask her what that means and then come to, you know, he never talked to me again. <laughs> <laughs> because as we know, the Bible, there is no source document. It is fragments of fragments of editorial revisions, of scribal footnotes, of political commentary. Right. And, and it's not that it wasn't inspired, but when you go to the unity approach of looking at it metaphysically, yeah. the, the, whole, the whole world uh, of the Bible changes. I have dear friends who are going to Israel for the first time mm -hmm. uh, in about two weeks. They wanted me to go with them, but... I couldn't do that. I've been four times, and I was telling one of the places I'd like to go is Megiddo, or Har Megiddo, which gets stretched into Armageddon. Yes. And and it, it's a hill, and if you look down from it, you see major crossroads where caravans would uh, be taking their wares to and from uh, the, the Near East. Mm -hmm. And they thought, well, this would be where the, the final battle was fought. But today... There's, nobody is fighting there. I mean, you, you have to look at that metaphysically yeah. or um, allegorically. Yeah. Armageddon is where the final battle will be. Well, we're getting away from my book, but I, I think this is just to say that I found healing when the medical world said I couldn't. And, and I want you to know that uh, my father was a surgeon. My brother is a doctor. They pretty much thought I was throwing my brains away by going into unity ministry. My, I heard the same thing when I was uh, going to be a minister. I, I would tell you that my father, uh, my, my, I came from the traditional American dysfunctional family. My folks split up when I was young. <laughs> yeah. Mother was a spiritual seeker. I'd studied unity and all manner of, of spiritual ideas. Dad was a Methodist. And he always thought Unity was that kooky church that my mother brought me up in. Mm -hmm. So when I told him I'd be a Unity minister, he said, I forbid it. Be a doctor like me. Hmm. And uh, he said, if you have to be a minister, for God's sake, be a legitimate one. Be a Methodist. <laughs> well, so I guess I'm an illegitimate minister, but I, 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 <laughs> loved, I loved the openness of it. Yeah. And uh, I love the healing. And, and Justin, I'll tell you. Unity got its start with healing, healing of uh, Myrtle Fillmore and then Charles. Right. And uh, it seems like 
as we got more into the 20th century, we sort of drifted away from that. We didn't want people to think like we're doing tent revivals and kicking crutches away or things like that. But yeah, but I had this interest in healing. How did I get mine? You, you know, doctors might call it a spontaneous remission or something like that because they can't explain it. Yeah. And I actually went to the founder of what was then the largest chiropractic college in the world in, in Atlanta. And I went to that man and, and he sort of had the reputation he could heal anything. And he himself had been a football player. And he at, at uh, Georgia Tech, by the way, mm-hmm. and he took a look at my x-ray and said, there's nothing I can do. Now, that was startling hmm. to hear there's nothing yeah. I can do. But as you begin to study unity and the history of unity, Myrtle Fillmore heard those same things. And Charles Fillmore heard those same things, but they refused to accept it. Yeah. And so to me, in all honesty, I was not trying to, quote, get a healing. What I was trying to do was feel my oneness with the Almighty, yeah. with God within me. And, uh, and, and, and regardless of whatever happened to the body, that oneness brought me a sense uh, of, of inner peace. Yes wholeness. Yeah. And that manifested itself in the neck and shoulder. So well, uh, that I, reminds me of Jesus saying, seek first the kingdom, right? Yeah. And all yeah. these things will be yours. I think seems to me sometimes you can want something so much that you might actually short circuit the, the flow if you're tense about it. But it sounds like you weren't, that wasn't what you were doing. You were seeking it, it oneness. And, and, and see, the thing that, that I see is sometimes when we pray affirmatively, when we visualize, we do these sort of things, we are partly saying we don't already have that. Mm. And if we can get in consciousness that we already have that, it will work itself out in, in our bodies. And I also believe, you know, you talked about prosperity. It works for that as well. But a lot of times when we're, sometimes we call it treating, I'm treating for a healing. I'm treating for a life partner. I'm treating for a great job right. uh, or the right home. Yeah. In that act of treating for it, we we are pushing it away from us. So that's a it's a tricky kind of thing because I do believe in affirmative prayer, and this book will tell you I believe in visualization. Right. And, and that, but but the most important thing is to get the the underlying consciousness underneath that. And I want to back up something that's kind of funny to me. And I didn't think about, so I was at Vanderbilt and we were going to play Alabama and understand it was the freshman team. The freshman couldn't play varsity then, but uh, we would have a pregame meal and a prayer. Uh, Today, a lot of colleges, high schools don't have prayers, but Vanderbilt's a private school. So I guess they still do. I don't know what they do, but so I did the prayer and one of my teammates said, well, John, you ought to be a preacher. <laughs> if I had listened to him then, I wouldn't have to go through that partial paralysis of my neck and shoulder. I know. Well, there you uh, go, huh? He he saw some. I, I've always I can't even remember his name. Don't know where he is. But that'd be fun to see him. Around. Said, you know, hey, guess what happened to me? You know, he had an intuition, didn't he? Now, he you know, intuition. I was surprised. I didn't know your background. That you had a pretty tough. Uh, childhood and and not only the injury, but you mentioned in the book your father left your your whole family. How old were you when your father uh, left the family? I was seven years old, and uh, recently my mother had inherited some money that allowed us to have a nice home. Okay. And then one day Dad was there. One day he was gone, and he uh, took half of mother's inheritance. And we did not know where he was. We would get letters from around the world. It was only a couple of years ago, uh, one of my brothers going through the uh, his papers and all said, oh, he joined the Merchant Marines. That's why we'd get a letter and maybe a little gift from uh, you know an exotic place. And then um, kind of my father figures, I got into sports and was pretty good at that, obviously. And those were my father figures but then in my junior year in high school, my mother was diagnosed with uh, uh, metastatic cancer 
And she died uh, a year later uh, in the spring of my senior year of high school. So I had Jeez. to, I had to get um, a, a lawyer to be my guardian so I could even finish school. And in the meantime, you know, I graduated. Uh, I was the valedictorian and had a scholarship and seemed like everything was going, but my mind was not really um, ready for playing college football or even going to college, but, but I did anyway. And um, the other part of this puzzle is that my oldest brother was a long-term schizophrenic. So we had not much money. Didn't know where our father was, you know, and it was kind of tough as a kid when people say, well, where's your father? And I, I didn't, couldn't say, well, he's dead or they're divorced. It's just, the answer was, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, well, how can that be? <laughs> I don't yeah. know, you know, so, but it was that his leaving that led mother to explore different uh, uh, spiritual communities and discovered and now we're talking about 1958 59 yeah a small unity church met in rented quarters and had for goodness sakes a woman minister now you think about atlanta 1958 59 with a woman minister yeah i can still remember her name carol marie guntel don't know if you ever came across her but i haven't uh, come across her that yeah. was kind of a i, I loved it yeah. and and what i loved is when you went to Sunday school, they didn't tell you what a lowly sinner you were and how you were responsible for the death of an innocent man. They yeah. did say you're a child of God. And, and in all honesty, I, I cut up some. And so the phrase, you're a child of God, was usually followed by, now act like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, and I, I, you know, I ended up my career back in Atlanta where I'd started and and I said after 27, 28 years, all my Sunday school teachers had either died or forgiven me so I could come back. <laughs> but one of them still remembers I ate more than my fair share of the cookies. Mm. And, and she said, now I know you were just hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think the your father leaving your family and your mom passing away when you were so young, how did that impact your, your journey, your spiritual journey? I mean, did that challenge your, what you had learned at the Unity Church? Um, how did well, that impact you? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, one, of the, one of the bad things I learned, and, and remember, the, 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 it's not that we didn't learn well. Sometimes we learned the wrong things too well. But in that Southern culture, that uh, coaches say, well, you ever feel sorry for yourself? You know, you know, you're a man now. You're nine years. I remember my little league baseball coach said, um, he said, son, I know all about your family. If you ever start feeling sorry for yourself, I'm going to get rid of you. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a call from another coach that you have been traded. You have been traded wow. to the Flyers which oddly enough, we were sponsored by Delta Airlines. I said, traded to the Flyers. He said, I'm going to pick you up at the corner. We'll go to practice, but you're now on the Flyers. And, and um, Because you out. were feeling sad about the yeah, death I, I, of your I, mother and so on? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, so uh, I remember we got to the practice field and his son was on the team. I said, well, who'd you trade me for? He said, nobody. Oh, wow. I'm nine years old. I've been traded for nobody. And you just that, lost your mother. Yeah. And, and so to me, that was an inspiration. I'm going to make something out. And our team then beat the other team and we won a championship and I was an all-star and all that sort of stuff. But, and I had a really good uh, coach, but, but you see that, that idea of what it means to be a man uh, is, you know, stiff upper lip and, you don't let it show that you've got emotions. I think, it, you know, if you're nine years old, you don't know where your father is. You don't always know where your next meal is coming from. I think you, you ought to feel sad, you know. And, yeah. uh, and so, yeah. How uh, could but it was, not? It, it was always struggling against that kind of uh, thought. And, and, you know, I mean, finally getting to 
well, even on the way to ministerial school and college, psychology, I took sensitivity training and learned to get in touch with the feelings and express them appropriately. I mean, my goodness, this whole business of, of what uh, the, uh, what defines a man and one is that you don't feel sad when you've had a major loss in your life right? and, and just stuff it down. Yeah. That's where the real problems come. When yeah. you stuff that down, then, then it, 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 it can explode on you. And, yeah. and sometimes, uh, Justin, I, I think in unity and new thought, we might try to affirm away those sad feelings or grief feelings. And right. what we need to do is use the affirmations and, and, and ideas in this book to deal with these, these deep, deep-seated ideas, but not to run away from them. Yeah. So looking at them and facing them and then having tools to do something about them. So I how would you look at, you know, your first principle, for instance, give thanks in advance? How would that and using your imagination and the other principles, how would you work with, say, you just had a loss or you're, something happened, you fire, were fired from a job or you lost a friendship and you got sadness and grief well, How do you work uh, with the principles and your humanness, so to speak? And, and see, I think one of the hard ones is to uh, to give thanks even in, in advance. And, and, and I get that from, you look at, uh, maybe it's not healing, but uh, Jesus feeding the thousands of people who are hungry. First thing he did was give thanks. And when he was going to uh, raise Lazarus from the dead, First thing he did was give thanks, and then we, we the, the scripture tells us if this is accurate, he did. He always knew God was with him, but to um, for the benefit of those around him. Yeah. So this is a strange thing. We we are taught at a child early childhood. Somebody gives you a present, you say thank you. Somebody does something nice for you, you say thank you. Somebody holds a door for you, you say thank you. Well, it it it, it doesn't exactly make sense to our human logic that when we've had a great loss, we say thank you. But what we're trying to do is is acknowledge the feelings and and go uh, go beyond that. And so to me to have uh, what was a terrible inner, uh, injury at the time, I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't give thanks for I look back at that so many times and give thanks and and I want to say, uh, because this is in the book too, uh, leaving this school and turning in a full scholarship, four-year scholarship, and I just felt it was time. There, there was, I was part of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes there, and that's a more traditional Christian kind of thing, but it was a place to go. Right. And the sponsor of that worked uh, he, with the World Baptist Sunday School Board. And I told him at the last Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting that I was leaving and why. And he said, may I come to your room? And I said, yeah. He could tell I felt defeated. Uh, I felt depressed. I didn't know. He, he didn't. I wasn't going to do anything bad to myself, but he didn't know that. Yeah. He stayed with me all night. Hmm. He stayed with me all night just to make sure that I was going to be okay. Yeah. And when I graduated from college and then graduated from ministerial school, I was had passed my last oral exam. We call it licensing and ordination. Uh, I wrote to him, that man, and I hadn't had any contact in at least six years, mm -hmm. seven. And I said, you, you may not remember me, but I want to thank you at a time when I was lost and hopeless and helpless, you came and sat with me. You didn't try to save me. You didn't try to convert me. You just sat with me. Yeah. And somehow he called the school and got me. They tracked me down. And he said, John, I am mad at you. <laughs> I said, why is that? He said, how do you think I could ever forget you? I thought, mm -hmm. oh, man, you know. I just thought I was one of many lost and hopeless, helpless students dropping out in the freshman year. Yeah. And uh, but but you see that kind of thing. 
that kind of community. Yeah. And I so appreciated him staying up all night with me to make sure I was going to be okay. And I think in some ways, yeah, that must have been the start of my healing. Yeah. I had a lot of hurt to overcome and uh, yeah. some about the school that uh, you had a lot of hurt to overcome. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, in the, in the South, uh, it's okay for a man to be angry. Yeah. Somebody does something to you, you lash out, you hit back and yeah. those kind of things. And, and uh, we, we know you can't overcome evil with more evil. Yeah. And so learning to not strike back. Yeah. And I feel that I have been attacked. And so to, to give thanks, it's like it, it's going to be a great energy shift that allows the consciousness to open to healing, to uh, bringing back a dead man to life, to feeding thousands of people with just a little bit of fish and a little bit of, of bread. Now, we can, we can look at that whole story of the feeding of the thousands of people with a little fish. There's one uh, Bible scholar who says, people that would go to hear a prophet on the side of a mountain, they would take food. It would be under their robes. They, the yeah. bread is not like bread we have, but the flat bread you can uh, unleaven that you can fold over, and they would have food there. But to, to have a little child come and and share what he had, then people were led to share what they had. But I think it is yeah. the giving thanks that changed the energy. Like, thank you, God, for this body that I have. One of the, the great friends of mine from college had cerebral palsy. And we were in an honor society together. And I love this man. He couldn't speak very well. He couldn't walk very well, but he was an honor student. And I remember he wrote a poem, and this was for the literary magazine of the college, about uh, how he loved waking up at this time of year with the coolness of the air and the autumn leaves and this. And I'm thinking, here's a man who can hardly walk or talk, and he has given thanks for the beauty of the earth all around him. Yeah. So that that's healing. And he never got a healing of the cerebral palsy. Yeah. But this was a whole man. He, he was not a partial man. He was not less than. He, he was whole. And yeah. that's what we're after is wholeness. Well, what do you, how, do you, how do you think uh, gratitude and praise helps you? I mean, what, what does it actually do if you're grateful? And what, 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 what are I'm, you praising when, you're, when you talk about praise in the book? And uh, Merlin Carruthers, I shared that story today. Yeah. Uh, very powerful. I mean, that was an interesting thing, this man in prison, who, again, not our unity thought, but, but he, he was a convicted felon. And he got the call to be a, a chaplain. Yeah. And he started praising everything. If he felt good, he praised that. If he felt bad, he, the food was good, he praised that. If the food was bad, he praised that. Now, that's an interesting kind of shift. And then one day, uh, people came and unlocked the cell and said, you're free to go. Your record has been expunged. Yeah. And he went on to seminary and became a, a, a famous a Vietnam chaplain. Yeah. And, and But the thing was, what changed? He changed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think we want prayer to change. You know, very few people, I think, uh, call a prayer ministry and say, I want you to pray for me, a wholesale change of me. What they want is change my spouse, change my boss, to get me a better job. Right. Do, change the outer. The thing is, as you change the inner, uh, change the inner, the outer takes care of itself. Yeah. But we get so outer directed. That's that's the thing. And, and praise and giving thanks. And I, and I will tell you this. I don't think I put this into it. But the happiest people I see are the ones who praise and give thanks all the time. The unhappiest are the complainers. Yeah. That they're criticizers, the fault finders. Why is that? Because it gets all that stuck in there. Uh, in their consciousness. And uh, Sandy and I were having a discussion about this, watching a movie that had a lot of ugly in it. Now, it was a well-done movie, but it had a lot of ugly. And it had I'm some a killing. movie fan, so I might have seen all that ugly. But the thing I say is, and I'm around people, they don't like me saying cancel, cancel to the movie or the, to the uh, yeah. news, you know. Yeah. But I'm saying, I don't, I don't want that to get into my consciousness. And I, I find this, 
don't want to get into politics. No. But during the political election season, oh, my word, we see these ugly campaigns and a person after person, I don't like that negative, I don't like that. But the, the thing is, the reason they do it is that it works. So I don't want to see all this thing because it's messing up with my consciousness. And right. to me, it comes back just into consciousness. Yeah. What's in your consciousness, you, you're going to get. And what I found, I used to like the late news in the evening. I said, I do not want to go to bed after mm -hmm. having watched the late evening news. Right. And, and, and uh, I had some really good friends who were newscasters. And, yeah. I just, and they came to church. And I didn't want to say, hey. You know, I don't watch you. <laughs> give me that negative news. And, and, and one yeah. of my classmates was a, a great author in Unity, Tom Witherspoon, wrote Myrtle Fillmore, Mother of Unity. I, I just treasure that book. Yeah. But he had been an uh, editor of a newspaper in, in uh, Illinois. And I said, oh, why doesn't somebody publish the positive news? He said, John, because it doesn't sell. Yeah. He said, if it bleeds, it leads. So yeah. what you're doing is putting into our consciousness. And I, I used to remember this when news was different when I was younger and you had Walter Cronkite. Yeah. Everybody loved Uncle Walter. But when he would come in the fall and say, the CDC out of Atlanta, my city, uh, has said that there's a new strain of flu. And after that broadcast, I'm sure 250,000 people across the country got the flu. Yeah. Well, but, 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 you know, part of it was he was trustworthy. Well, if Walter says it's it's the flu season, it must be the flu season. And what can we do? And so right. but get the flu. Well, so you start yeah, believing but, in the flu. Yeah, you believe in and, and getting what are you it, putting into your consciousness. And when when it comes, we touched on visualization. Someone asked me once. He said, uh, "What kind of pictures do you hang in the living room of your home?" He says, I don't, I don't care whether you like impressionist or modern or the great classical pieces, but it's something that when you get home from work, you've had a rough day, you look there and you look at that picture of a sunrise or a mountain or yes. the, whatever it is, flowers, whatever it is, yeah. makes you feel good. Then he said, what kind of pictures do you hang on the living room of your mind? And I had to yes. say, well, I need to, I need to give some thought to that. Yes. And yeah. that's what uh, that's what we have to to watch because uh, oh, okay the visualization the imagination it is one of the strongest and easiest powers given to us but we're we're usually not very conscious of it mm -hmm. and so to learn to be conscious and and decide what what pictures. Well, we have and say, okay, this is coming across the field of my mind, yeah. but this I will say no to, and yeah. this I will say yes to and embrace. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. Now, listen, you know, I come from a doctor's family, but we have given so much of our power over to doctors that they say you have a year to live, you have a year to live. Right. And, and so uh, who can we listen to that says we, we can change this? Yeah. We can be healed. We can climb mountains. We can do all sorts of wonderful things. And 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 yes, we listen to the doctors. I, I think that's part of it, too. Yeah. It's a balance. Yeah. Um, you, you know, Justin, I've had people, especially when I was younger, my first ministry at 23 years of age, a woman came in with just a really uh, nasty kind of uh, growth on her face. And she said, yeah. I, want, I want this to be healed spiritually. And I said, I'm going to pray for that to be healed, but I want you to see a dermatologist. And she said, well, I want a spiritual healing. And she closed the door and never came back. And I saw her six months later in the grocery store, and they had just a thin line right there. You could hardly notice. With a little makeup, you wouldn't see it at all. And I said, it's so nice to see you. So how are you doing? She said, I'm great. She said, you know, when I came to talk to you, I was angry when you said, go see a dermatologist. So I went to see the religious science minister on the other side of town. And he's an older man. In fact, he's, he's uh, getting ready to retire. And I said, well, what did he say to you? She said, get that thing taken off. <laughs> yeah, so, it was nice to, it was fun to read in your book how people used to tell you you're too young to be a minister at 23. 
I yep. know I had that happen a number of yeah. times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, that's the sort of thing is like, we live in a modern age where um, I, th I think uh, one of my teachers in ministerial school, he believed in spiritual healing and he had good luck. He said, but I also believe an aspirin is uh, is an answer to prayer for many. And yes. he said, I've been, I've healed lots of things. Dental work. I've never been able to heal. So I go to a dentist to get my teeth fixed. So Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It reminds yeah. me of, uh, I think it was, I did a, in high school, I did a term paper on psychokinesis, mind wow. over matter. And I remember someone saying, you know, people are trying to move the salt with their mind. And they said, why don't you just reach over and grab the salt? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Why are you trying to move it with your mind? Just reach over and grab it. So practicality, right? What do yep. you tell people, John, when they have given thanks in advance They've applied principles like imagination and other things, and their prayer doesn't seem to be answered. Answered, you know, they're, they're uh, maybe they want the soulmate, um, maybe they want a healing of their body, and they've been doing, they've been listening to talks, they've been meditating, they've been praying, they've been affirming, but it just doesn't, it just ha hasn't happened. What, what do you tell people uh, when something like that happens? Well, the thing that, that I have to say is uh, stick to itiveness is, is a good one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've often prayed, uh, God, give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> right now. I want yeah, this yeah. now. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and I'll tell you another story about this. That, that he, This is a friend of mine in, in church, loved to come to church, loved everything about it. And he had to have emergency surgery that saved his life. And he said, Don, I'll just tell you, when your life's on the line and you're on the operating table, <laughs> this affirmation stuff doesn't work. And, and I said, would, would, you, would you tell me about your prayer life? He said, yeah. what do you mean? I said, do you, do you have prayer and meditation every day? He said, no. And I said, well, it's like building spiritual muscle. You know, the athlete doesn't, run the great speed or the great distance or pole vault over the high bar up there at the beginning, yeah. they work, they practice, they practice, they practice. And, and what I say is we never know. There's a threshold, I think of, of healing or prosperity or getting a mate. And, and we never know how close we are. Mm -hmm. We might be just, just that close yeah. and we give up. Yeah. So don't give up. That's the thing that, that, that is, uh, to get across because we are in a world of instant consciousness, or we think we are. We have uh, instant meals. You know, when my mother died, I didn't have anywhere to fix meals, so I had instant breakfast. I thought pouring a glass of milk and stirring in some of this protein powder was a was a perfect thing for me who didn't know how. But but it it takes some time, and and then we we sometimes read of these people like. Uh, Eckhart Tolle seems to just wake up and one day he was a bum on the street. And next day he was a spiritual master. How did that happen? I, I don't know how long his soul or how many lifetimes, if you believe in that, was working on till he got that point and he, and he crossed that threshold. Yeah. So we've got to cross that threshold. And mostly what we're having to do is sweep out all the negative things we, we have believed. You know, one of the items of this uh, book is about the power of belief. And I've yeah. taught this many times for many years. And, and uh, usually there's someone puts their hand up and says, I don't like this idea of belief because there's embedded in the word believe is the word lie. And I said, exactly, exactly. We have believed lies about ourselves, about others, about the world, about how well we can be and how long we can live and how prosperous and how happy. And we believe those lies that 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 is what we have to work and and get rid of. And, and I love what it said, I believe help thou my unbelief. Yes. Well, yes. I, I've been believing the wrong things. And I don't know if you believe in, in past lives. Uh, I do. A lot I do. Yeah. Time. But definitely. I think when you're in the womb, you can hear the things going on uh, on the other side, your parents and their thoughts and, and their arguments and their fears. And 
and and and we get some of those things even before we're out, out of the womb. And, and you remember when Jesus was asked, well, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? He says, neither, but that the works of God might be made manifest. So one of the things that I think is really a block to healing yeah. is our unworthiness. I must have sinned. I must be. We're not into that. You know, I, I, yeah. I have a, 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 in, in a church a young woman who brought her husband who was in a traditional church. And, and uh, afterwards, I was curious how, you know, she and her mother came and they loved it. And I said, well, how do you like it? He said, well, you, you know, people laughed in your church. I said, they're supposed to. I said, funny thing. He said, well, we don't laugh in my church. And he said, and you didn't talk about sin. I said, I don't like it. So uh, if we talk about it, you know, it's going to expand. It's going to grow. If we talk about our problems, we get bigger problems. They multiply. So yeah. you, this, you, you've got to get the belief turned around, and that's pretty difficult. Well, how can I change my belief? I've always believed this, and that's why I'm always going to believe this. Right. And, 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 I, and I tell you something about that. When You know, when I was down and out at 18 years of age and I'd failed at football and I had an injury, and my friends who were there when I was up kind of abandoned me, and I had friends who sort of had a negative view of life. And uh, life is bad, the government's bad, everything's bad, you know, da 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 But they were there for me, and as I began to go back to this community of spiritual-minded, meditating, positive, visualizing people, I began to feel better. And I said to my friends, listen, you can change your life. You can change change your attitude, change your beliefs, see better. And they said, oh, you don't expect me to believe that Pollyanna crap, do you? I said, well, yeah. 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 And they said, well, so I, that's well, the I power of good community, isn't it? Being around I positive people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the power of community. I had to let go of those friends who were not willing to go on a journey with me. I am grateful for them. If I see any of them, at a reunion or something, I'm grateful for them. Yeah, I had to make a conscious decision. Not that I didn't love them and wasn't grateful for them, but to me, I wanted health and wholeness. And it was not getting there by running everything down. So yeah. uh, that that power of community is so very, very important. And, you know, our parents always told birds of a feather flock together. Right. But uh, it, it's that you, you have that same energy I think I alluded to this in the book. I once drafted a book and never really went, but the sympathetic vibration. Yeah. I think the world operates according to vibration. Yes. And so if you go into a room and you don't know people there, it's not long before you've gravitated towards some and are repelled from others. Right. So, so to have a support group uh, that are sympathetic, I have a Zoom call each week with people of sympathetic mind and we hold each other in prayer. I have a home also in Arizona uh, where we have mindful meditation. I'm not the minister. I'm not the leader. But we have a group of us that sit, and and we mostly sit in the silence. Yeah. And uh, might have a little lesson on mindfulness. Yeah. But I love that. It's a supportive community. It it lifts me up. And there are times I needed lifted up when I couldn't be lifting myself up. And that's what the group's about. And then... There are times when others in that group need lifting up, and I'm there for them. You know, I was just reading recently um, how teenagers now, uh, it's, it's a big problem with teenagers, as young as 10, 12, who are struggling with anxiety and depression more so now than ever before. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people during the pandemic, after the pandemic, are struggling with anxiety, depression. Can these mm-hmm. principles help someone uh, deal with those kinds of things? What, what kinds of thoughts do you have, John? I know you mentioned in your book, you know, you were on a panel where they were asking you, how did you deal with the depression as yeah. a young yeah. man and even later in your life? What, what, uh, what could you say to folks? Um, well, I, w- I want to tell you about this because I think it will help but also getting professional help if you need it. I was on a panel once. I I outed myself in front of my congregation. <clears throat> I don't know if you should, in school they told us don't do this. I said, folks, 
I have suffered from depression. Now, I was the director of Silent Unity. I got the Light of God Expressing Award and all that. And it's like a big gasp. And because of that, somebody uh, got me an invitation to be on a panel in front of a room full of psychiatrists, psychologists, and uh, MSWs that, uh, to, to talk about that. And, uh, you know, and then everybody in the congregation who was depressed came to me for counsel. It's like, now that was depressing. You know? <laughs> I'm kidding. But, but you see, uh, just because you're a minister and you have a piece of paper that says you've passed all the exams, doesn't mean you stop being human. Right. You stop being human. And so um, to ask for help was hard for me. And, and uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing, you know. And, and I remember some people in the church said, you know, I knew all that beauty was in there. I was wondering if you're ever going to let it out to be real ah. uh, with, with us. And I think, man, that's a, that was so freeing for me. To that, but to but to have groups that understand that, and you're not defective uh, because uh, life is ganged up on you. There, there's a humorist in California said, "Yeah, I try to take life one day at a time, but sometimes several ga days gang up on me." <laughs> so yeah, has, has anybody avoided that? You know, and 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 I have to say that I sort of grew up when unity was like. You come to church on Sunday, and I'll give you these three ideas, and you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise forevermore. And that may last through the end of the day, but then, all right, what do you got for me this week? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you, you know, it's it's like it takes a community for us to help one another. And here's one of the things that was just sad for me sometimes, because our church services were positive. We had great music. It was rah, rah, and upbeat and that sort of stuff. And then I'd have people say, Don, I, I just can't come to church. I don't feel good. I feel down, and everybody's happy around me, and I just feel like I don't have a place there. Yeah. So, oh, man, that's that's when you need to come. That's, I've that's experienced to that, too, there. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like, so uh, the other thing. So you were giving people permission yeah. to, yeah, you're on a spiritual journey. You're on a spiritual path. But you have your humanness, yeah. And you may struggle with depression, yeah, or struggle with some other challenge, and that's okay. That's that's why we come together is to support one another and to do our best to to grow and transcend that, right? Yeah. And Justin, there was there, when I was director of Silent Unity, I would sometimes be called on to speak at a church where maybe a minister was ill or some someone had died. And I show up, and the, the, besides the fact the congregation's grieving, they are angry because the minister never let them know that they had cancer or whatever they had. And they said, we wanted to be there for him. He was always there for us. And then yeah. one day he's gone. Yeah. And, and so, whew, you know, to be, to be that minister that shows up on a Sunday after your, 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 your minister has died in the saddle is... Uh, it's really a hard, hard thing, and 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 that I think, I think as a movement, and a philosophy, we we are getting to be uh, honest with one another, and we can be open, and we can share who we who we are, and there's nothing wrong with having a minister who's human. Uh, yeah. You know, I I know you love to play golf. I, I always tell people, I had to give golf up because I didn't like my congregation hearing that kind of language out of me. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> and I and it was not golly gee willikers. You know, you hit that ball into the water hazard for the third time. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh my. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my. Yeah. Uh, so at the same time we don't want to give in to negativity and wallow in it, right? Because you're you're mm -hmm. Your book is The Eight Keys to Healing and Wholeness, yeah. and they're very positive keys. And mm -hmm. so there's a dance, right? There's a balance yeah. Yeah. between, yes, I'm, I'm wanting to give thanks, I'm wanting to be grateful, and I'm struggling with the depression too, right? Yeah. So there's kind of a balance we've got to find for ourselves, isn't it? Uh, getting yeah. the support, getting the the maybe meeting with a, a therapist or someone 
mm -hmm. and, and um, doing the things we can to take care of ourselves while also practicing these principles. It, it is, and it, and it is a dance, and I think what we don't want to do is have one layer of negativity. Oh, I have this illness or this prognosis or diagnosis, and then I say, well, I, I didn't have the right consciousness. There's something wrong with me, and then I beat myself up because it's one. I have this, and I beat myself up. Yeah. I love this one minister, and I won't call his name. I don't have permission, but but he's a great minister and a uh, large, large gathering. And he went to visit somebody in the hospital, and, and she said, well, what's in my consciousness that, that I had this? And he said to her, some I would never say, I don't think you would ever say, but he said, oh, shut up and get well. <laughs> so, and, and, and heaven forbid. That we sounds don't like go, Ed Rabel, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Heaven forbid we don't say, oh, what's in, in Bill's or Joe's consciousness that he got this, we can get into that high horse sort of thing yeah. ourselves. Well, you, you know, have a that, great quote in your book that's related to this. On page 31, you say, in the ultimate sense, an illness is neither good nor bad. It just is. We place our human judgments on it. Yeah. What do you mean by that, John? Can you tell us more about that? Well, th this is to me high level thinking because, gee, there's this illness. That's bad. And, and, and bad is a human kind of uh, judgment. But, you know, we learn judge not lest you be judged or judge with righteous judgment. I think we have a power of faculty of judgment for good judgment. But it's got to be above that, that human judgment. And, man, I tell people this because it, this is a lifelong project for me. I come from a long line of judges. Not a one of them was a lawyer or served on the bench wearing a robe. We judge others, you know, man. I, you know, and and that that is not good for them or for us. Yeah. And so, to, to to lay that judgment is is again laying a second layer of neg negativity. I might say to myself, "Oh, John, shut up and get well." What you're about is a journey to get well. And it's not about blame or shame or guilt of anyone else or ourselves. But all right, we have this. We're presented with something. We're not happy where we are. But the thing is, most of us try to fix them out there or the government or the boss or the spouse or the children. And, and uh, we don't do very well at that. Yeah. And, and what we have to work with is ourselves. Yeah. And what can we do to build consciousness? Because... The premise of the book is it starts with life is consciousness. Yes. We get in our lives according to what's in our consciousness. It's not easy yeah. to change consciousness. Sometimes I made it sound like it is, but it's not easy to change consciousness. Yeah. But it's a whole lot easier than changing the world. Yeah. So yeah. Now, now th there's some who will not believe that the consciousness causes uh, the, the illness or the prosperity challenge. But one minute Sterno said, say, well, it at least gives permission to it to happen. So that's an interesting way of, of looking at it. I think there is a causal relationship. Ed Rabel, you're talking about, and one of the great teachers, and he was probably the inspiration of me taking, uh, writing this book and adding a few more ideas than, than he had. He always said consciousness is the how-to. How do I get well? He said you build the consciousness or in the case of the woman who touched the hem of the garment of Jesus, make contact with someone with a healing consciousness. But, you know, we don't always know if a person has a legitimate healing consciousness. So the best thing to do is create our own. And that's what I have here. I'm not saying you read this book and apply it, you'll be healed of everything known to humankind. But I believe it'll push your consciousness in the direction of healing. Yes. And that's that's the important thing. Yeah. And I love love the unity approach, or at least I think it's unity. My approach is here's what I've found will help that have helped my life be better. Yeah. If if it helps you, take it. If it doesn't put it aside, if any part of it helps you, take yeah. that. So yeah. that rather than say, I've got it all coming, I'll sell you this bottle of snake oil and it'll it'll cure yeah. what else. Yeah. It, it's, this will push you, your consciousness, in the direction of healing. Yes. And, and, and that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. So key three is 
is love is the answer, the only answer, key four, will, willful and willing, um, and key five, faith with hope and imagination, key six, imagination, key seven, forgiveness, and uh, key eight, authentic action. I like the fact that you emphasize, you know, you got to do something. You can't just, it's just not all thinking, but you know, let's be practical. You maybe get a medical checkup if you need it. Uh, go to the dermatologist and remove that. Eat. I mean, I share with people, encourage people, make sure you're getting proper nutrition. Make sure you're exercising. These are part of God's laws as well, right? Yeah, and, and I, want to, I don't want to sound critical or judgmental. We just said don't do that. But been in unity a long time. Yeah. And I think there was a tendency to skip the last step. So we're going to sit and meditate and visualize, and then it's it, it's going to be there. And, um, you know, uh, say my, my brother was a pediatrician at first, and then he later became uh, an allergist, immunologist. But when he would work in uh, the charity hospitals as part of his training, people would wait. In, in his opinion, too long to bring in this child that had a condition could have been treated easily, quickly if they had come in. Yeah. Now there's a lot of reason they didn't. A lot of it, if it's a charity hospital, they didn't have money and, and yeah. these kind of things, or maybe they were an illegal immigrant, things like that. Yeah. But the thing is, it goes too far and, and this condition has gone so far down that, it, that it's hard to take care of it. And so yeah. when it can be taken care of, uh, early, but but the whole the whole package is the exercise and the nutrition and the prayer and 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 meditation and and I, and I want to get back to that prayer and meditation. There was a wonderful minister who's passed on now. He and I were roommates at a minister's retreat. Yeah, and he said, uh, John, don't talk to me the first forty five minutes in the morning because I'm going to be meditating. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, don't be that way. He said, no, nah, John, don't, you don't be that way. He said, my, my wife went to a Vipassana meditation and she came back and she was on fire. And she says, don't talk to me first thing in the morning, 45 minutes. Don't turn on the radio. Don't turn on the TV. Don't talk to anybody on the phone. And he said, well, as long as she's doing it, I got to do it. So at that point, I said, you know, I've told everybody to meditate, but I wasn't doing it. Mm. You know, I was hit or miss. It has been 25 years since I've missed meditation. Yeah. And did it keep me out of trouble all the time, 100%? No, but it helped me deal with whatever came up for me. Yeah. And so we say these things. And I said, does that mean if you do 14 years and you miss a day or something? Like but but have a daily spiritual practice. Yeah. And, and I think... Um, <laughs> You know, again, we get get we can get kind of lazy with this, and so uh, yeah. let's don't let's don't be lazy. You know? Yeah, let's not be lazy. I'm just going to ask you one more question, and then what uh, you talk about, uh, you give the eight principles, and then the second part of the book are additional ideas for healing, like prayer and meditation. Yeah, and one of them you say you talk about your definite chief aim, something oh, Napoleon boy. Hill used to talk about, which I remember yeah. reading in my 30s, and mm -hmm. I struggled with the chief aim because I was like, well, is my chief aim an outer thing or is it an inner thing? You know, should my yeah. chief aim be spiritual enlightenment or should my chief aim be a financial goal? Because that's where he kind of focuses on an outer goal. And I'm just wondering from your highest perspective, what do you think the chief aim of life ought to be? I mean, do you have to have a specific goal that you're living for? Or what is the highest chief aim, do you uh, think? Going, this, is, this is really important. Yeah. And um, I heard Napoleon Hill speak when I was a young man. And uh, his book, Think and Grow Rich, probably changed millions and millions of lives. Mm -hmm. Now, I... I decided to come up with a definite chief aim. It wouldn't have satisfied him, but I was a young minister, smallest church, but I wanted to be something. 
And, and so I wrote, I aim to lead the unity movement to significantly greater numbers of followers, growth in spiritual consciousness, true prosperity, and a place of great importance in the world community as a practical religious way of life based on the religion of Jesus Christ. Wow. And it's like, no, he wanted a simple sentence, but I did that. Yeah. And my spouse and I said hours to each other. Within about a month, I was invited back to Unity Village to be an understudy to the director of Silent Unity. Well, yeah. and 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 I and, and I was doing all those things. Yeah. And then at some point, there's what uh, Eric used to call divine discontent. Yes. And I said, you know, this is all about ego. This is all about John Strickland being a big shot. Yes. And uh, I said that that doesn't work for me anymore. Yeah. And so I changed it to. Uh, I know and express God in everything I think, feel, say, and do. Oh. I know and express God in everything I think, feel, say, and do. Now, a yes. business leader, Napoleon Hill, would laugh me out of the room and said, that's, but that's what I want the rest of my life. Yeah. And, and you look at that and say, are you doing that? And you yeah. can be at the world's headquarters, and you can be wonderful things at Director of Silent Unity, but are you really... Knowing and expressing God yeah. in everything you think, feel, say, and do. What yeah. would a life be like for you if you lived that? And and yeah. so I also put in there, like, write your own epitaph and see if you're living that. Yeah. Oh, he was a this, he was a that, you know. Are you living that? Because the question I have is, what do you want to live longer for? What do you want to get well for? Yeah. You know, this is a this is a big, and and you can't answer it uh, for anybody else but you. Yeah. And and you know, when I was doing weddings and do premarital counseling, I'd say, you know, you you both need to have a definite chief aim in life, and 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 this is what I want you to do. Write it, then say it to each other every day. Because if you're building your life on what you're here for. And that other person building their life and what they're here for, that's that's what you make the marriage out of. Mm -hmm. Now, now we want to have a home in the country and we want to do this and we want to see the world and we want to do all that sort of stuff. All those are those are good things, but you're making those the object of your existence rather than yeah. what are you here for? And there's the, the only in, in, in all honesty, Justin, very few of those couples got what I was saying, that yeah. one just went right over the head, you know. Yeah. Well, we, we're in love. We want to get married. We want to have a family. We want to do this. We want to live happily ever after. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but you, you know, you need to you need to give serious stuff. And, and one couple that was so sweet, they met in a master's program in social work. And shortly after they got married, they went to India and they served these people and they would write letters about riding a bus over a mountain pass and it breaks down and you have to hike snow and ice to the next village. Yeah. Their life was thrilling and fulfilling. And because, you know, they, they knew when I sat down and talked with him, what, what I meant when I said, what are you here for? Yeah. And, and if you don't know, you're just taking up space. Yeah. I love and that. I don't I want you taking up space. Yeah. That's so, very powerful. And, you know, it speaks to living, being God every day. You start to find fulfillment and joy in the moment, in the now. It, yeah. it, it's not something that has to happen out here. Uh, you're not living for some future thing. It's something that can happen every single moment, no matter yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're, you're I mean, being it. You can be sweeping the floor and letting God be God through you. Right now, now yeah, you're not. I mean, you go down the street and you see an old shoe in the road. You say, "There's God in that old shoe." Somebody made it. Somebody wore. Somebody threw it out the window. I don't know how it got there, but you look at that and say, "That's a thing of beauty." Mm. And I think about what kind of shoes did Jesus wear? You know, probably a scrap of leather and a thong or something on it. You know, but yeah, oh, we got great shoes. You got, you got great shoes. I've seen your shoes. <laughs> Thank you. you. Know, like, <laughs> but but somebody made them. And I hope in, in the shoes that I make, they didn't play substandard uh, wages and substandard condition because they were making it in some country. But, you know, yeah. but that somebody somebody was was proud of that. You know, my grandfather, my, 
and I have to remind people of my southern accent. My my uh, grandparents on my mother's side were from Flushing, oh. and grandfather was a was a marvelous uh, custom furniture maker, wood carver, beautiful museum oh, okay. type pieces. But right. he used to take a modern piece of furniture that you know mass produced, and he looked at that and said, "Ah, it's no good. It's too perfect." Yes, it's no good. It's too perfect. He his life. You could see it in that in the wood that he carved and all yeah. that. And were there errors? That probably were, you know. And I, I love that about you know. I live in in Arizona, and uh, uh, like the Navajo blankets, they purposely put an error in it. You oh, know, do so they? That, so that they're not pretending that that they're gods. There's a little separation between them and God. Not I my see. theology, but I always just think it's kind of nice that it's this whole perfection and, and I have it or gets in the way of, of a really good life because it's yes. got to be, you know, it, it's perfect. There was a funny story to me. Uh, I was the most valuable player in my high school football team, like big whoop, but it was important. And I was moving across the country and, 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 and the trophy got broken. Uh, oh, it's like, did I stop being the most valuable player of my football team? No, I, I went to a trophy shop and got him to put another thing on it, you know, but it's like, yeah. oh, well, this is the one. Like, come on, you know, really? And, yeah. Uh, perfection, you have to have that perfect trophy that, you know, is just tarnished. I don't sit, I don't take time polishing that trophy. I've got it sitting on a shelf somewhere. And, yes, uh, yes. But, uh, a lot but, of yeah. uh, Olympic athletes and champions get the gold medal and it goes in a shelf somewhere eventually right That's and there were some on a, some on a football team and in, in uh, this state I'm in that they needed money so they sold their championship ring and got in trouble for that you know got gotcha. you got gotcha. you yeah. right yeah exactly well yeah. John I don't want to keep you any longer uh, is there something that that we I haven't asked you or that you'd like to say that you you haven't said before we close up? today? Well, I, I just want to say how grateful I am to be back in New York, my beloved New York, and uh, to see you and happy and you're doing your work and playing a good game of golf and that. And, um, you know, uh, all ministries are great, but you have one that's really fabulous there. I've seen what you've done with the building and that, and I'm just, I'm real proud of you and the ministry. Things change. Things don't stay the same. And if you think they do, you're wrong. So you you have taken that and you're doing it and you are blessing people. And, uh, you know, I think about today uh, how advanced the electronics and the broadcast and people, I don't know how far away people are watching, but they can, from what, but, I thought when I went to my first ministry and we could afford an overhead projector so I could put a, a foil on that and show the 12 powers on a screen. Yeah. How advanced yeah. could you be? You know, yes. You have, yes. Well, things have evolved a little bit, haven't they? It's uh, amazing. They, and, and, and you have to. Yeah. Things are different. And I, I believe your music comes from not in the center, but somewhere else that they they yeah. plug in different places we had someone from nashville today and someone from california a couple from california yeah. now singing. how cool is that and yeah um you know we used to talk about uh, I, I remember in a church when we started getting into computers and uh and i talked about high tech and high touch and we'll be doing a lot by computers and some people were going ah, ah, ah. It wasn't long before we took our bookstore, which is no longer easy money. They used to be easy money. Yeah. But then Amazon and all these others started selling, Walmart and Sam's Club started selling uh, metaphysical books. Right. We turned our bookstore into a computer center. Mm. And, and I thought, okay, what's going nice. on? You know, who, who wanted it was the older people who had grandkids living a continent away or maybe an yeah. ocean away. And yeah. they could be involved in their lives, but at first there was resistance to it. Yeah. So the fact I could be here with you and uh, and see you, you know, and yeah. I, I, I'd say, you know, uh, you're not supposed to covet anything of a neighbor, but 
man, I'm looking at your hair and I'm thinking. <laughs> well, I have developed uh, what Wayne and I used to call a solar collector up here. And so it's a uh, solar panel. Yes. Solar panel. Well, thank but, you. Uh, thank you, John. Just, thank you for having me here. And it's pleasure. Feels, now, feels before good. we go, where, where can we get your book? Where can people get your book, John? Well, uh, I have a website. And uh, you can do that, and it is uh, www.thinkfeelheal, all runs together, thinkfeelheal.com. Okay. And, and I will mail it to you. Okay. www.thinkfeelheal.com. Excellent. And I'm happy to say my new shipment my, is the third printing of my book. And I would also say that it's, it's simple. And ministers that I've shared it with, and I have not been pushing this. Yeah. You know, I gave you a copy. Thought you might like it, and I'm so pleased that you do. But, but they, I think it's easy to teach. Yes, easy to understand. Yeah, I think it'll help people's lives be better. I so think it's a fantastic book, John. I think you wrote you. a really great book, and people are really going to be helped by it. So and, thank and, and you. That's we're that's why we're doing a five week series on it. And um, you have a book that I don't have, and that's being reprinted, I think, right? Yeah, we're getting it reprinted. So uh, well, I'm going to get, get you a copy of that. Get me yes, a copy sir. Of that. So, hey, I love you guys. Love you, Justin. Thank so you so much, you. John that's Strickland, true. author of Think, oh. Feel, and Heal. Thank you so right. much, John. God bless you. God bless you. Bye bye now. Bye bye. All right, thank you.